Hello everyone, I'm Dr Hannah Lonsdale, Research Associate at Johns Hopkins Old Children's Hospital and Future Clinical Fellow in Paediatric Anesthesia at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Welcome to Machine Learning 101 for Anesthesiologists. Thank you to the IARS for the opportunity to present today and to all of you for listening. I have no disclosures. 50 petabytes. 50 quadrillion bytes. That's the volume of data that your healthcare system might well be producing on an annual basis. To put that into perspective, it probably took your computer less than a minute to download this presentation today on your home Wi Fi. Any idea how long it would take to download 50 petabytes of data? Over 250,000 years. And that's just for one single healthcare system. What do we currently do with all of that information that is generated by our clicks, our lab pathology and imaging requests, and typing into the EMR? Are we effectively using this data, or does it merely sit there? Perhaps to be called upon for reference at a later date. There is so much information there that can help us to improve patient safety, boost efficiency, and even discover new, more effective and personalized treatments. For most of us with our current audit and research projects, we are barely scratching the surface. 50 quadrillion bytes is a pretty intimidating number. How can we lift this huge volume of electronic data and use it for more than simply a convenient digital version of the storage system that we've had for over 200 years? Today, I'm going to talk about how machine learning can help us to dig deeply into our electronic medical records. I'll give a 101 overview of machine learning, an introduction to what has become known as big data, and go on to talk about the challenges in the present and the opportunities of the future. I am an anesthesiologist. I'm not a statistician or a programmer. I am a bit of a nerd, but we'll try to keep that under control as we take a jargon-free jargon walk through our topic today. Machine learning is out there in our everyday lives. It gets us around in our cars through GPS, assists us in our homes, keeps our credit cards safe from fraud, and many more things from Google searches to those kind of annoying targeted ads on social media. When many people hear machine learning, they think of humanoid robots or androids. But in reality, machine learning refers to programs, also called algorithms, that give computers the ability to create models that perform human-like actions such as problem solving, object and word, word recognition, and decision-making by generating complex mathematical func functions. The geniuses who program these computers are known as data scientists. You should search one out in your organization or university. They're usually found hunched behind an enormous bank of computer monitor screens, peering at lines of code in languages like Python or R. Machine learning sits within the broader scope of artificial intelligence. Again, probably no robots, but instead computer programs that learn from and react to data without explicit instructions from human users. And okay, sometimes there are robots too. One of the questions in your mind right now might be, why on earth should I bother with machine learning when we have all these established biostatistics techniques that give us great results? Anyone thinking that? If we were in a live conference room right now, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I imagine there'd be quite a few. Well, here's the thing. Machine learning is statistics. Many data scientists come from a stats background. The only difference is the data analysis is the amount of human guidance in the data analysis process. For data sets with thousands of columns and millions of rows where complex nonlinear relationships may exist between multiple variables, machine learning is likely to be more efficient and to offer the, offer the potential for deeper insights. The other and more exciting reason for using machine learning is for its role in deeply personalizing treatment by making tailored recommendations for each individual patient. More on that later. To illustrate machine learning as part of the statistical continuum, let's look at some examples. 
Here's you, a healthcare provider who might see over the course of their career, perhaps 10,000 patients. Completely human guided, maybe with some textbooks. This is the mortality rate from the US census. Okay, they use a computer to calculate the rate for a denominator of 300 million people, but it's basic math. On the next level, we have large data sets with traditional bias statistics. So some use of a computer and a lot of human guidance. This is one cardiovascular risk matrix from the SCORE study of 250,000 patients in Europe. Moving up, we have algorithms from Google and Netflix, still somewhat curated by people, but moving into the realm of machine learning. Next up is one of the best known machine learning projects in medicine, detection of pathology from retinal images. And this is a branch of artificial intelligence or AI that has been the most successful in medicine to date. It's known as machine vision. These algorithms developed to analyze imaging from radiology, ophthalmology, and pathology form the backbone of less than a hundred that are currently approved by the FDA for clinical use. Oh, how does an algorithm learn? Imagine you're studying for exams of multiple choice questions. It's not difficult. MCAT, USMLE, boards, we can't get away from them in medicine. You have a bank of practice questions paired with their correct answers. And these answers would be known as the ground truth in machine learning. And the question and answer pairings would be known as labeled data. You start answering the questions using your existing knowledge, set aside those you've answered correctly, study some more, reattempt the incorrect questions, plus more as yet unseen questions. And you repeat that process until you feel that you're consistently meeting the required standard for the test. You take the final exam, which consists of new questions on similar topics, and your exam performance is rated as a grade for the paper. Machine learning is very similar. We have a data set, our question bank, which is divided into training and testing sets, usually in a ratio of maybe 70-30. The training set becomes our practice question bank and the test set is our exam. The algorithm examines the training set and formulates a statistical rule that it thinks will correctly link those sets, just like answering an MCQ practice question. It then compares its answers to the correct answers and selects out the correct and incorrect predictions. It reviews the incorrect answers and alters the statistical rule to take account of the errors. But unlike us, the algorithm starts from a point of zero knowledge, so it takes many, many iterations. But once it reaches a point with little improvement after new iterations, we can use the testing set to assess its performance. We also may have an extra piece of the testing set held out, the validation set. And this is used to tune the machine learning models hyperparameters, the controls on the learning process. And they may include the learning rate and the batch size, which is the number of records or samples that the program will analyze each time before checking for errors and altering its statistical rule. A little more terminology before we move on. The MCQ exam ample we just discussed describes the most common type of machine learning used in medicine known as supervised learning. This finds a mathematical function that maps patient-related variables, patient features, to the outcome of interest, known, as you might have guessed it, the output. And this input might include patient, surgical, and anesthesia factors. And we ask the machine learning software to link those factors to the outputs, such as presence or absence of post-operative acute kidney impairment or the risk of intraoperative hypertension. Unsupervised learning identifies patterns and dependencies in the data without a prescribed endpoint or output. It hasn't been used as much in medicine, but it is useful for data exploration and the production of new hypotheses. So I might give an unsupervised learning algorithm a slew of data, say from ICU patients, and ask it to for look, for look for patterns that link them. I think of reinforcement learning as like operant conditioning or training a puppy. Who got a new pet since the start of the pandemic? Reinforcement learning occurs by trial and error. 
The algorithm is rewarded when it makes a successful prediction and it is punished when it gets it wrong. But there are no dog treats or stern words. Punishments and rewards are mathematical modifiers of the statistical rules generated by the computer. Let's now shift out of terminology to give us a break and to briefly talk about the data needed for machine learning. Big data is becoming one of those annoying marketing buzz phrases like touch base, boots on the ground, and do you have the bandwidth for that? But it's the easiest phrase we have to describe data of sufficient volume, variety, and velocity to be difficult for humans to process. That 50 petabytes, or even much smaller chunks of it. For supervised machine learning, I'm afraid size really does matter. Although there are no strict rules about the minimum size of a data set, remember that the computer is starting from a place of zero knowledge, so it ideally needs thousands of those labeled data samples. A label lists the output of interest. So that might be whether the retinal image is from a patient who has glaucoma or does not have glaucoma, or a data set belongs to a patient who had perioperative AKI or did not. These large data sets may come from the EMR of one organization or many. It could come from a registry or as a secondary use of data collected from another study. Ideally for machine learning, we need data that is of high quality, clinically relevant, with few missing values, and is closely related to the population we wish to study. How often do you think that happens organically? Therefore, we probably need to do some work before we can let the computer start to learn. And this is known as pre-processing or data cleaning. In reality, this work usually takes the data science team much longer than developing the algorithms themselves. Anyone who has done any data collection can likely empathize about the time it takes to get your data right. My appeal to you as a research and clinical community is to think about how we currently collect data through our EMR and to optimize this so it's not just a storage bank of records, but a powerful living system that can be tapped for new discovery and insights. Data pre-processing involves several steps, such as removing outliers, like a respiratory rate of 200, likely a typo, imputing missing data. Machine learning doesn't function well when values are missing. There are techniques that vary from simply removing the record or variable from the analysis to complex, statistically computing multiple plausible options and allowing the model to work on all of them. We need to select appropriate features. Machine learning can accommodate hundreds of thousands of variables, but allowing models to use data fields that are irrelevant or highly unlikely to add value is inefficient. We need we also need to make sure to only use features that would be available at the time the model is clinically useful. No good taking the amount of interoperative fluid given from your retrospective data set and using that as a feature in a model that will be used to give a preoperative prediction of a need for vasopressors. That fluid volume information would not be available for a prospective patient preoperatively. And this is why these processes must be guided by subject matter expert physicians working closely with data scientists. I talked about the need for expert clinicians to collaborate closely with data scientists, but there's actually a whole heap of stakeholders involved in taking a machine learning model successfully from the data set to the clinical workflow. And this group has been termed the AI care team. It consists of data scientists and engineers, expert clinicians, IT support, end user providers, ethicists, and a project manager to keep us all in trouble. Now that we have our beautifully pristine pre-processed data set, we can set the machine learning to work. Here are the names of some common types of algorithm that you might see used in machine learning research. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses, so it's common for data scientists to use several types of an algorithm on a data set and select the one which performs best. A couple more terms before we take a look at how to assess model performance. A model can either be locked at the end of the development process 
or we can launch it for use, but keep feeding it data from new patients as it is captured. So that type of model continues to refine itself, even as it predicts. As you can imagine, both types have to be carefully monitored to make sure that the model doesn't become less accurate over time. Once we have developed using all of these features, we might want to check if we can simplify it by removing any of those features that aren't of value to the prediction. And this makes it easier to use in the clinical workflow as we need to feed fewer pieces of information to the model to get a prediction for our patient. That type of model with a reduced feature set is called a parsimonious model. Most machine learning in anesthesiology is used to predict something, AKI risk, perioperative mortality, hypotension on induction. So their performance can be assessed just like any other kind of medical test, which might be more traditionally designed to predict bowel cancer or anemia. If we tested the model's performance on the exact same data set it used for training, it would get perfect scores. But the model would have also learned randomness along with the actual patterns in the data, the noise that masks the signal, like when someone wearing a pulse ox probe waves their finger around. The underlying signal is still there, but it's masked by noise that we don't need and can confuse us. And the algorithm doesn't necessarily know the difference. In machine learning, we call this learning of irrelevant signals that complicates the algorithm, overfitting. The idea of creating a predictive model is to use it on prospective data. So it has to learn patterns that are generalizable to new data sets with similar patients. But if it is overfitted to the current training data because it has learned too much randomness, too much noise, it won't work well on our new data. Therefore, we split our data, as we already discovered, into training and testing sets and use the testing set to evaluate performance. Sadly, there is not one measure that covers all aspects of performance, but I'll cover some of the most important techniques. I hope you've had your coffee because here come the stats. The most commonly reported measure is area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. It's never phonetically pronounced ORIC, and I've no idea why, but that's a tip for sounding like you know what you're talking about when talking to data scientists. Here we have the AUROC from the study by Arvind and colleagues, development of a machine learning algorithm to predict intubation among hospitalized patients with COVID-19, hot off the press. Here's a little reminder that there are multiple names for things in statistics. A perfect model would have an AUROC of one, with a straight line across the top of the chart. A model that performs no better than random chance would have an AUROC of 0.5, shown on this chart as a dashed black line. The blue line is from the machine learning model, and the green is the ROCKS index, a more traditional validated prognostic tool for prediction of mechanical ventilation, shown here for comparison purposes. The ROCKS index is the ratio of pulse oximetry over a fraction of inspired oxygen to respiratory rate. For a given model, the threshold at which it makes the call of positive or negative can be adjusted to optimize different parameters. So a more sensitive model versus a more specific model. And you can think about this like setting a transfusion threshold for bleeding or anemia. The higher we set the transfusion hemoglobin level, the more we prevent complications of low hemoglobin, but the more patients receive transfusions with their associated risk. We need to set a threshold that prompts an action or intervention to change practice. If I want to minimize false positive predictions that might overwhelm providers with false alarms and alert fatigue, I might set a low threshold, accepting that I would miss some cases. But if the cost of missing cases was high, let's say for use of a life-saving treatment, I might accept more false positives as a trade-off for increasing my true positive rate to 100%. Here, I catch 100% of the cases, but 50% of my predictions are false negatives. Here's another study with receiver operating characteristic curves by Hoffer and colleagues. 
but it's really well written paper. I recommend looking it up to test your learning after the session today. Remember when we talked about data scientists using several different types of algorithm on a data set? It's common to report the receiver operating characteristic curve all on one figure for comparison. It looks a little messy to the untrained eye, but let's dive in. We start with a familiar value, the ASA score. And that's the lowest value here in blue, but it still has a reasonable AURC at 0.839. We also have logistic regression and deep neural networks, different types of machine learning model. Here we have the reduced refined feature set, which is one way to describe the simplified parsimonious model we discussed earlier, where features that are unlikely to contribute to the model have been removed. OFS here describes the full original feature set. And we can see that the best performing model achieves an AURC of 0 0.903. Well, pretty close to one, right? So it sounds like a really good model. Well, there's a catch. AURC is good for looking at a population level. It might not be quite so good for a clinician using the model for a single patient in front of them. And here's why. AURC is independent of prevalence. Let's check out the details in this prediction. Here's a quick reminder of what I learned in medical stats class as a truth table that data scientists call a confusion matrix. It's the same thing. We have the patient's true condition along the top and the condition the test predicts along the side. We want to optimize the number of true positives and true negatives and minimize the false predictions. This is the confusion matrix at the threshold Hoffer and colleagues chose for their predictions of perioperative mortality. Their model with its AURC of 0.9 got almost all of the patients who didn't die correct. Great. But we saw from the previous slide that the mortality rate was 0.79%. So if the model could just cheat, and predict that every patient would survive, it would be correct more than 99% of the time. Luckily, models aren't able to cheat. But this highlights an important challenge for machine learning and all predictive statistics. When prevalence is low, the ratio of positive and negative outcomes in a data set, here, death or survival, is very high. And we call this class imbalance. It's really common in anesthesiology for there to be a big class imbalance for adverse events. And that's because you out there in the audience are doing so well with patient safety that you make serious adverse events very rare. Keep it up, it's a really great challenge to have. Therefore, we need a measure that takes account of prevalence. Do you know one? If you are thinking positive predictive value, you are correct. Here, the PPV is 32%. So roughly one third of mortality predictions are correct. Let's be clear, this is a good model. It's just tackling a really difficult problem. The model has many, many examples of patients who survived. And so it gets really good at recognizing the factors linked to survival. As in this case, 100 times fewer patient records to learn about perioperative death. So it can't figure out as many patterns to make a correct prediction. When we think about the future clinical utility of machine learning, this illustrates the importance of both selecting the correct problem to address and in curating the largest possible data set to train our models. The data set in the study contained almost 60,000 procedures. The numbers in the truth table, the sharp eyed may recognize are much lower because as you will recall, Data sets are divided for machine learning with the largest section being used for training and the smaller proportion used to test the model and report performance metrics. A more in-depth way to look at how prevalence affects performance is the precision recall curve. Here we return to the COVID study by Arvind and colleagues. We have moved recall, better known to us in medicine as, positive, as true positive rate, or sensitivity onto the x-axis, where it's easiest to think of it as a, how many patients the model identified who need to be intubated. Now the y-axis shows precision or the positive predictive value, 
which we can think of as how often the model was right. The precision recall curve helps us to set our thresholds. And again, this is done by collaboration between clinical experts and the data science team. If we want to be right almost all of the time, so eye precision, for instance, we've decided to preemptively intubate those patients knowing they're going to deteriorate. We set our threshold at the maximum to be right as many times as possible. But that only captures a very small number of patients who need intubation. Alternatively, if we decided we'd like to capture a large proportion of patients, perhaps we're going to use an intervention with a much lower cost or risk like continuous pulse ox monitoring. So we set our threshold here to identify 80% of patients who will need to be re-intubated. We therefore capture far more true positives, but we also capture many, many false negatives. And so we are right less than 20% of the time. As you can see, setting the threshold needs careful thought to get it right, specific for the purpose of the model. In most situations, it will be set somewhere between the two extremes discussed here. Further way to optimize the threshold is to use a metric called the F1 or F score the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Okay, so we've pre-processed our data, trained our models and assessed their performance. How do we know how well they're gonna perform out there in the wild in a clinical workflow? We can start with validation. This describes the model's performance on data sets and combinations beyond that initial training set. We've already encountered a type of internal validation, the testing set. Others you might see mentioned in papers include K-fold cross-validation and bootstrapping. And these are all types of split sample validation. But we need to go further to see if our model is generalizable beyond our starting data. And this is called external validation. We collect new data from the same source that we run our model and test its performance. And this is called temporal validation. Or we might get data from similar patients, but with the same variables from a different hospital site, a different country or continent. And this is called geographic validation. Once we think we have a validated model that is accurate enough to be useful in the clinical workflow, we need to test it out. So we can set up the model in the EMR with a data pipeline, which automatically feeds the values needed to our model and we can test it in silent mode where it doesn't affect the clinical workflow. Unknown to clinicians, so we can find out if it identifies the appropriate cases and also how many of these are already predicted and appropriately treated by clinicians. We don't need a model to tell us the obvious stuff we already know or to tell us things we're already doing. We could also do randomized trials where we sometimes present the model information to providers to see if we can correctly influence their practice. The important thing to rem remember is that as we've seen, no machine learning model is perfect and they are intended to be used as decision support and guidance and not as a substitute for clinical acumen. We're not about to be out of a job anytime soon as a result of artificial intelligence. On to the elephant in the room. Who here is thinking, but machine learning is a black box. It could be dangerous if we don't know how the model works, what's going on inside or how it determines the answers. Well, here's quite literally another type of black box. It can potentially be pretty dangerous. Who knows how the engine works in a modern car with all of the latest electronic modifications? I imagine that if you're like me, you have a rough idea of the functioning of an internal combustion engine but you'd be unable to go into detail about what happens between stepping on the gas and the wheels turning to go to the grocery store. Yet, we take our kids to soccer practice at 70 miles per hour on the highway alongside all of the other drivers in their two-ton black, silver, maybe red boxes. Have a quick think. What about a vehicle and our road safety systems gives us faith that our cars will get us and our passengers safety to our destination. You may have thought vehicle safety design and testing, familiarity and trust, mandatory inspection schedules, post-market surveillance, driver education, 
and a detailed and strictly enforced set of driving rules. Trust in any new technology or technique is a giant, genuine concern. Without it, we're simply not going to change our practice. We're going to need the equivalent of all of those things that help us to trust driving. As data sets get bigger, all statistical methods, not just machine learning, have become more complex, requiring powerful computer algorithms and a specialist level of knowledge that is impractical for almost all positions to master. It feels like every time I pick up a journal, I see a statistical task that is unfamiliar. We still need to trust that the information we're given is reliable and accurate. Raw machine learning presents relationships between variables in a fashion that is un unreadable to the human eye. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, is investigating what we as humans require to understand and trust artificial intelligence systems, focusing on three areas more explainable models that do not sacrifice performance, effective explanation, interfaces to translate models, and the psychological requirements for effective explanations. One easy way to start to understand the model's workings is feature importance or feature ranking. We can interrogate some types of models to ask which features were most important or carried the most weight in producing the prediction. Here, is the feature ranking for a model to predict the transfusion requirements in pediatric craniofacial surgery. We might not be surprised that the most important features included the platelet count, the preoperative hemoglobin, and the hematocrit. And that feels reassuring that the model's on the right track. We cannot, however, assume that these are linear relationships. For instance, that by increasing the preoperative hemoglobin or choosing to use an antifibrinolytic, over here, that we will reduce the transfusion requirement. Although for these particular examples, there are plenty of other clinical studies out there that can give us an answer. We also cannot currently infer causality from machine learning models, including this one. One of the current strengths of machine learning is in creating new hypotheses, although the identification of causality in machine learning is an emerging hot topic that's really interesting. An important point about the clinical use of machine learning algorithms is to ensure we're using them for the population they were designed for. Just like I know that it's not practical to use my car to drive from here to my kitchen or from here in the USA back to visit my family in the UK, one proposed strategy for this is the model facts label. Just like a drug carries indications, contraindications and precautions, we could summarize the usage information for machine learning in a similar fashion, as suggested by Sendak and colleagues. Perhaps it's a novelty idea, but it stresses the need to use models within the bounds of their design. Regulations are one thing that helps us feel safe when we drive a car. Products based on machine learning are considered software, and this software may be considered a medical device by the FDA. The FDA is currently well into the process of developing its approach to machine learning, which considers the unique methodology, especially those continuously learning models that refine themselves as they predict in the clinical workflow. The priority is to protect patients, but also to launch new technology in a safely expedited manner. This is likely to involve the FDA pre-approving specifications and an algorithm change protocol, and developers and manufacturers in turn, committing to transparency and real world, world performance monitoring. Machine learning brings up a complex set of ethical and legal considerations, which could easily take a full session to discuss by themselves. Many models are trained on real world data sets for treatment delivered to actual patients by physicians like you and I, rather than on a known gold standard of care. And there is plenty of evidence that the healthcare outcomes, for instance, of minority groups fall below that expected, and that this is a result of systematic bias. Although machine learning aims to add no further bias to predictions, if we do not adjust for bias in the training data, it becomes baked into the model. 
As we develop models, we must be sure to develop not only what we can achieve with progressive new technologies, but on what we should create based on sound ethical principles. And this will create and maintain public and clinical trust, which is essential to acceptance of machine learning as it matures into the widespread clinical environment. That future is full of possibilities. In the final few minutes, here are a couple of things that machine learning may soon be able to offer. The first builds on the model to predict intraoperative transfusion requirements that we considered a minute ago when looking at feature importance. We have developed a calculator powered by the machine learning algorithm that gives prospective recommendations for an individual pediatric patient based on a personalized basis when that patient's details are entered, which could be done automatically by a data pipeline. This process can even become more automated if it is inserted into the EMR. And finally, in the next five to 10 years, we may see emergence of a more complex use of machine learning, the human digital twin. A digital twin is an ultra high fidelity mathematical model of a system constructed from all available information. For us, that system is the human body. All available information could include not only our EMR data and imaging, but genomics and exposomics, which are the non-genetic exposures that contribute to health, such as environmental pollution, weather, diet, stress, and we can also add in information from the Internet of Things, which are fitness trackers, Bluetooth BP monitors, maybe even smart refrigerators. We could create a human digital twin for each patient or each person, even before they become a patient, and use data analytics, machine learning, and even information from genome projects like all of us to discover digital biomarkers of health and disease that permit earlier detection and treatment or allow us to tailor nudges to effectively improve health. In conclusion, machine learning is still a developing tool for patient care and clinical decision support. The use of technology in medicine frequently lags behind other industries because of the complexity of our work and the high safety standards that are essential to protect patients. But we only have to look to our own personal lives and how they have been enhanced to see the promise of what will be achieved in the near future. Thank you for listening today. I'm happy to chat further through email or social media, and I'm looking forward to your questions.